everyone, everybody. Uh, my name is Court. I would like to welcome you to the second official episode of our new podcast, Mass Media Hysteria. Uh, it is February 28th, 2021. We got a whole bunch of topics to discuss today, and I will let you know what those are in a second. But first, I would like to introduce my panelists, my co-hosts, whatever you guys want to call yourselves. Uh, first, uh, my buddy, Chris. Hey, how's it going, everyone? And uh, down below, my uh, friend, Andres, who is making his first appearance on the show. Howdy. So uh, what's going to happen today is we, like I said, we have a bunch of topics. First, I'm going to do a very, very quick review of the new Disney Animation Studios uh, film, Raya and the Last Dragon. I'm basically going to read the tweet that I put out because that's all I'm allowed to say. Um, then we are going to, let me check my notes again. Then Chris and I will be doing our review of WandaVision episode eight, the penultimate episode uh, titled Previously On. Then we will talk about the news that J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot are going to be producing uh, a new Superman reboot for Warner Brothers and DC. There's a little bit to talk about there. Then we will jump into talking about the new teaser trailer for Zack Snyder's upcoming Netflix zombie heist movie, Army of the Dead. And then we'll slide into staying with uh, Zack Snyder. We'll slide into Anthony Bresnikan's article uh, for Vanity Fair, which was all about Zack Snyder and Justice League and what happened in the theatrical version of the movie and the upcoming Snyder Cut. And then finally, we have a conversation that is going to be posed by Andres. Andres, do you want to tell us uh, basically what we're going to be talking about? Absolutely. The question which I've written down is, what was the remake you feel was better than the original and why? All right. I think that's going to be fun. And of course, uh, if you want to jump down into the comments and leave your answer to that question and reasons why, that would be awesome. I read all the comments and I try and respond to everything when I can. So uh, without further ado, let us jump into the first topic, which is Raya and the Last Dragon. I got a screener from Disney. Uh, this film will be coming out on March 5th on Disney Plus with Premier Access. I think it'll cost you probably 30 bucks. Uh, it also is coming out in theaters, depending on um, where you live, if theaters are open. The basic premise of this film is uh, a long time ago, there was this world called Kumandra and all these people lived together with these magical dragons and then evil entities showed up and the dragons all died and the humans sort of started warring with each other. And now many years later, hundreds of years later, this young female warrior named Raya has to try and find the last dragon. So, uh, like I said, I can only read my tweet because the embargo is still up, but you will be able to see my full spoiler free review on this channel tomorrow, uh, Monday, the 1st of March at about 12, 15 PM. It should be going live. But what I wrote simply is Raya and the last dragon is a stunningly beautiful film. The animation is exquisite. The score, the voice acting, the mythology, it all works. You may want to put a box of Kleenex on retainer. That's all I can say. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed the film. I hope you guys all check it out um, on March 5th. So uh, are you guys looking forward to this movie? Um, it was on my radar. I, I wasn't super excited leading up to it. It was just one of those kind of like, hey, I'm interested. I'll, I'll check it out. I was kind of waiting to hear some reviews on it. So hearing, you know, you kind of praise it so highly is definitely kind of bumping up my excitement for next week. What about you, Andres? Uh, I do have a question about the film. Is Sean Connery voicing the dragon? Because he was the last dragon. I actually, uh, I don't want to say. Um, he is not in the film. Uh, I, I can talk about the cast. Uh, the dragon is voiced by Aquafina. Okay. Uh, we also have Kelly Marie Tran is the, uh, of course, Rose Tico from the last couple Star Wars films. She is, she does the voice of Raya. Uh, you've got Benedict Wong in there. Um, who else? Gemma Chan, Sandra Oh. It's a good cast. Right on. Cool. Yeah, so, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to it now. Nice. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Maybe we'll do like a full review next week. Yeah. Once we can cut, talk a little more in depth in with it, I suppose. Right on. Yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, let's talk WandaVision. Cool. Um, um, go, go, no, go ahead, please. Oh, um, I, <laughs> do you have a queued up? I, I'm not, I'm not good at lead-ins, I suppose. Okay, well, uh, I suppose that, uh, again, this was the second last episode. It was called Previously On. It was essentially like a flashback episode. Um, we get a cold open, which I'll touch on in a second, but then it's basically the witch, Agatha Harkness, 
walking Wanda through all of her past traumas to try and understand how Wanda got the power to create the hex, to create this world and control it. Agatha even says something like, um, I can't remember how she says it, but she, she wants the power to control such a huge thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the cold open, uh, I will say, was kind of the biggest issue of the episode for me. It's it's a big flashback going back to Salem, Massachusetts, 1693. It's a witch trial. Uh, Agatha is being tried by other witches. So it's a literal witch trial. And as soon as I saw that title card, uh, Salem, 1693, I got absolute chills. And then the scene did absolutely nothing for me. What did you think of the scene? Uh, yeah, I, I had a very similar kind of reaction. As soon as the title card came up, you know, Salem, Massachusetts, 1600s, I thought that was awesome. It's like, yeah, let's let's kind of bring in some some actual, um, you know, witchcraft lore in throughout history. Uh, it's always like a fascinating time period. And I was curious to see what they were going to do. I also thought it was like a fun little twist when they asked, like, you know, uh, Agatha, are you a witch? And she's like, yes. You know, it's like it's it's essentially kind of a, a twist on on the actual witch trials that occurred at the time. Uh, but then, I, as I mentioned to you off off the show, it kind of lost me in the sense that it eventually just turned into this big light show, and it felt mm-hmm. very Marvel. In which I know it sounds stupid because this is the MCU. This is very much an extension of uh, all the films leading up to it. But the the show up until this point has been so unique, mm-hmm. especially compared to other MCU properties. Um, so when all of these witches just started shooting these, you know, energy beams of light out of their hands, it's like, okay, this feels very kind of superhero. This feels like something that we have seen dozens of times, countless of times within the MCU. Right. So I, yeah, it, it kind of was like, oh, what are they going to do with this cool setting? Nothing. And it, at the end of the day, unless it plays in the bigger part, uh, in the next episode, it's kind of pointless too. It's that doesn't really add to much. That that's kind of how I feel. I mean, like, what did it tell me that like Agatha's really powerful? I already uh, knew that. Like, yeah. if again, if this does pay off in the finale, awesome, cool. I, I'm here for it. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I didn't. I didn't feel like it informed the character in any way that I, I sort of didn't already know. Yeah, hey, I can. I completely agree. Uh, the only other thing that it might have shown was that she was she's lived for ages you know she she seems to be maybe not immortal but she she has a very very long life um and and i get that it's you know in general you want to show don't tell but at the same time there might have been a better way of of showing it than like i say it was i i don't want to make it seem like this ruined the entire episode because it was very brief it was what maybe two minutes two three minutes something like that yeah so it's not like it brought everything to a screeching halt but it was kind of like and, and I should say before we move on, and this is on me. Uh, yeah, this is a spoilers review. I probably <laughs> should have pointed that out earlier. I will, I will, I will put a, something on the screen uh, before we yeah. put this live. But For sure, just spoilers and yeah. flashing lights. I'll put it in the description and all that. But Perfect. Y- yeah, so, so that opening didn't do much for me. The one, the one thing, and I did not notice this on my first viewing, but I caught it the second time. Uh, when, you know, the head of the witches is Agatha's mother, um, and when she's kind of, when the mother is really giving it to Agatha, there is a shot where she's got a sort of magic crown thing, which did look a little bit like the Scarlet Witch headdress. So it kind of begs the question, again, at the end of this episode, when Agatha says, you are the Scarlet Witch, is the Scarlet Witch, is that uh, some like a mantle that people take on? So was her mother, was Agatha's mother the original Scarlet Witch? What do you think about that? Um, I, I noticed that too, that there was like a crown and it looks similar to kind of the headpiece that uh, Wanda wears from the comics that we also see a bit of a glimpse of uh, a little bit later into the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought, yeah, there has to be some sort of connection. Like maybe it's a literal kind of crown of like, you're the queen witch, I guess. I, I don't know the exact lore that they're going to go into, but I noticed that too. One thing I'll say about uh, Agatha's mother being the Scarlet Witch is one that her energy color was blue, like my back background light. Right. Um, and I think that there's like a literal reason why they call Wanda the Scarlet Witch. Okay. And, and Agatha even said something along the lines of, towards the end of the episode, that it's like, I, you're supposed to be a myth. Um, so I think that uh, there is a connection in the sense that the queen, the mother witch was maybe kind of the head of that coven. And so she had kind of a royalty. She was the strongest at that time. But 
uh, the Scarlet Witch might be something that's even more powerful, something that's that's stronger than than anyone's ever seen before. Okay, and so before we go through uh, any more plot points, do you want to do you want to just give me your sort of overall feelings on the episode? Yeah, definitely. I um, I've seen it twice. The in the first time, I couldn't help but kind of shake this feeling of okay, I, I just want to get to some conclusions. I, which sounds impatient of me, but I, it, cause it, the title's literally previously on and we're kind of going through stuff. Again, some stuff that we know, some stuff that's kind of new and revealed to us, but I was still, I, I think I've, I've just been teased one too many times with this show and that I'm, I'm really kind of, I'm so thankful that there's only nine episodes that there's going to be a conclusion next week. Although I'm not sure how they're going to wrap all of it up. Um, so I was a little bit impatient during the first watch through of this episode, but the second time around, I really appreciated it. And I think that in repeat viewings, this is probably going to be a standout episode because it's, it's quite good. It's, there's a lot to like about it. There's a lot of um, the main thing, the main takeaway that I got is that this is the best that Elizabeth Olsen has been in the show. Um, I, I, hands down. Absolutely agree. And, and not just the show, but it, in, in her entire, um, MCU career. This is the best. It, she she's had to do so much heavy living throughout heavy lifting throughout the entire show, but this episode in particular is just one traumatic event after the other after the other and she crushes it. She she nails every scene. It's pitch perfect. Uh there's a particular moment later on um that well, I'm sure we'll touch on that is just like heartbreaking. Just the, her delivery and in the impact of it. Um and that's really what the episode was. It was uh like the title suggests, it was going through is Agatha kind of working in a sense as like a audience avatar to an extent of exploring what led Wanda to do what she did. D like create this hex because that's one of the big questions that we've had from the beginning is what is this hex? Um who created it and why? And why with the TV shows? And they do answer pretty much all of that in this in this episode. And the short version of it is that that the girl's been through a hell of a lot. She's just, it's just been one traumatic event after the other. Um, it's been a rough life for her and she's lost pretty much everyone that she's loved or cared about in her life. And yeah, I think that'll make anybody, you know, um, have a mental breakdown. I, I, it's one of the more sympathetic and empathetic characters of the MCU now. Just, it felt, I mean, as, as regardless of how heightened it is with um, the magic and the superpowers and, and, and everything, it felt very real as as some as someone going through grief. Yeah, it was it was very much a character study and like a meditation on grief. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I, to sort of piggyback on uh, your saying, this was the best work she's ever done. I also think this is the best written episode of this entire series. There was, yeah. sorry, I'll, let me just say, and we'll we'll get to it. But there was one line in this episode that I've been thinking about it. It might be my favorite line out of all of the MCU that I can think of, but we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I was, I was just agreeing. I, that, I think that um, the dialogue, especially in this, was, was just spot on. And it was much more grounded. And it, not just grounded, but it was, it, there was more weight to it than you would, you, what's kind of accustomed to the MCU. And I like the MCU a lot, but it really, the dialogue switches between expositional dialogue and kind of funny quips to kind of keep the the levity up this this got heavy and it went to places that were real um not like i said not just superhero stakes not just stakes of we have to save the world very real grounded issues that i think a lot of people can can relate to on a personal level which is surprising for an mcu show right mm -hmm. um well so yeah we'll just i don't want to take too much time on this episode because andres is Andres doesn't watch the show, so he's just kind of sitting there. Yeah. But uh, we'll go. We'll go just quickly through uh, a couple of the main beats. So the first flashback is, of course, uh, back home in Sokovia as a kid with Pietro and her parents, and they're going to. You know, people have theorized that maybe Wanda grew up watching American sitcoms. Now we know that's true. They're having TV night, and I know for me, as soon as the episode or as soon as the scene started, I, I, I was certain. I was like, this is the scene where the bomb's going to go off. And I was waiting for it. And I have to say, to their credit, they timed it in such a way that it still, even though I was totally waiting for it, it startled the heck out of me. 
Oh, absolutely. I, I don't know what I really expected. I thought that maybe there would be more warning. There'd be more of a warm up, like maybe you hear uh, air sirens that, you know, bombs were coming. But yeah, so when they're when these two, it's there was it's a brutal image, too. It's just two young kids watching TV and boom, they just get rocked by a, a literal explosion. Mm -hmm. And it's not graphic, but it's still like that's that's dark, man. It's heavy. Yeah. And then, of course, we see uh, what they talk about in uh, Age of Ultron, of course, the Tony Stark bomb coming down that just kept beeping and never went off. And they were sitting mm -hmm. amongst it for like two days. But we learn that actually the reason why it didn't go off, it wasn't a dud. Wanda sort of subconsciously used magic that she didn't know that she had mm -hmm. to keep them safe. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. One of the reveals for for long, uh, long time MCU fans in this episode was that up until this point, we were led to believe that both Wanda and her brother Pietro um, were just regular people that essentially got where they re they got powers through working with Hydra and the and the uh, the scepter that Loki had, Loki's staff. That's kind of what we were led to believe that they just did these tests and then there was like powers came out of it. Um, but in this, it was revealed that she was pretty much a witch all along from from birth. She she had these these gifted abilities. And I like that they didn't make a big, they didn't like stop. It wasn't like a big revelation. It was just kind of, it felt natural and organic to the story that it was right. revealed in that way. Well, and then of course we, the, the sort of next flashback is, is what you were talking about, the experiments at Hydra. And I thought it was really cool where, you know, the Mind Stone came to her mm -hmm. uh, all, 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 almost like she, she drew it to herself. Yeah. And that is essentially what awoke the powers in her. But mm. we get that great moment where it kind of explodes and it's connected to her mind or what have you. And she mm. sees uh, a vision, not vision, vision, but she sees a vision of the Scarlet Witch sort of exuding power. And, and we again, we see this sort of headdress. Mm. What did you think about that? It was good. I, I it's it's still a tease, but it, it's it's definitely got me excited. It's it's in, it was such a, like a it's so brief, like rewatching it, it, it's, it just goes by like in a flash, but mm -hmm. it's really getting me primed that I'm, I'm, yeah, I feel like we have to see it in the last episode, right? Like before the end of this show, hopefully, hopefully they, don't, they won't make us wait for Doctor Strange 2 or anything, but right. I'm hoping at the end of this next episode, we see her in the full Scarlet Witch gear because even that silhouette, just kind of looking at pictures of it afterwards, it looks good, man. It's, 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 I, I'm happy. It seems like a, a great blend of kind of like the comic imagery of her, of her costume, but, you know, modernized and kind of a made to fit more like cinematic approach. Um, so, and it, but also I, I like that. Well, I, I guess I'll touch about it, uh, about on this more at the end, but the last thing essentially just talking about Wanda being the Scarlet Witch, I don't know about you, but I always just kind of took that for granted. Like I, I could be wrong, but I thought people had already called her the Scarlet Witch within the MCU before. Like I thought it was just like a nickname the same way, I don't know, Captain America is a nickname or the Falcon is, you know what I mean? I didn't know that there was uh, a significance behind it, um, but apparently there is. Well, and I guess, uh, you know, I, I think I was aware that nobody had ever called her that. And I think I just mm -hmm. assumed that maybe the people at Marvel thought it was a bit of a goofy name. So they just, like, you know, not a lot of people in the X-Men movies call him Wolverine. They just call him Logan, right? Yeah, that's true. But um, I, I just assumed that I didn't realize that the Scarlet Witch was being set up to be almost a separate entity. And I do. I did get this impression. I feel like it's a, a bit of a Dark Phoenix thing happening. Yeah, um, totally, totally. Just somebody who's been taken too far and then this explosion of power that turns her into a villain or so it seems to me anyway that's the direction that it's going no for sure i mean it's hard not to to make that comparison obviously they're both um they're both marvel properties wanda in the comics is the daughter of magneto um both jean gray and and wanda are these magical uh women who have a color scheme that's most typically red so it's easy right. to kind of see those those connections, which but I like it. That's an interesting story that I don't think has ever actually been done uh, to the fullest extent with the X-Men properties, uh, both X-Men Last Stand and X-Men Dark Phoenix were kind of disappointments and they didn't really do justice to that Dark Phoenix story. Right. And even though, you know, this isn't quite literally the Dark Phoenix story if they go in that direction of this, you know, once hero that goes to the dark side, very, 
very Star Wars Anakin style. That's interesting. I'm I'm very I'm curious. That could lead to some really kind of interesting uh, subject matter for them to tackle. Right. So uh, the next scene, of course, the next flashback is Wanda having a sit down, just having a conversation with Vision. I ima- I imagine this takes place shortly after the events of Age of Ultron. I think she still had a bit of the accent. They're clearly not in a relationship yet. He's just coming to check on her because mm-hmm. she she just lost her brother, and this was far and away my favorite sequence of the entire episode. It was so beautifully, elegantly written. Uh, They're both so good. Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen are both so good in the scene. Mm -hmm. She's talking about how grief is a wave and it keeps knocking her down. And every time she thinks she can get back up, it hits her again. And then Vision says the line, this is the line I was alluding to earlier. Uh, And it's just, it's just beautiful. I actually had to, when he said it, I had to pause the episode because I was like, I need to, digest that a little bit but he says what is grief if not love persevering and that just that like got me what did you think about that line oh yeah it, it hit me in the same way um it it's it was really kind of i didn't pause it but I, I really just like stopped to think like did a marvel show just say this like like i said this is <laughs> isn't this a series about punching bad guys and in silly costumes and it's this is that's some real stuff you know i as someone who's kind of you know lost people in in my lifetime um it's a real thing grief is i it's it's in, it's really impressive to me that that line kind of encompasses what how the entire show has been been affecting me to an extent that it's it's not kind of beating around the bush it really is like we're gonna talk about grief um this isn't we're not even gonna kidify it that much even though it's on disney plus i mean obviously this isn't this this is not like r-rated material or anything like that it's still family friend friendly to an extent but it's like i said i'm, I'm really appreciating uh kevin feige and the team behind this um going to real places i think that's that's kind of a key to keeping this uh franchise fresh is making it relatable not not just keeping it as like fun super heroics but you know you keep that emotional connection with the audience with with real uh, emotions like this right hey i'm just I, go ahead i do have something to contribute oh, <laughs> go for it uh that's that's a big thing with marvel in general though they've that's like versus dc it's marvel as a property has always been more about relatability i mean mm-hmm. you, look, you look at spider-man you look at x-men even Tony Stark to a degree, it's it's all about you do find these things to relate and then it just makes it better. Oh, for yeah, sure. That's, that's true, yeah. Yeah, Those absolutely. my two cents. No, 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 I appreciate that. Real quick before I throw it back to you, Court, it, it reminded me of a... A lot of people don't like this one, Iron Man 3. I quite enjoy it. One of the few things, one of the things I was just going to say about it is that in Iron Man 3, uh, throughout most of it, Tony Stark is going through panic attacks and having mm-hmm. anxiety. And it's not really paid for laughs. And for as someone that's, you know, dealt with a lot of anxiety in his life, I was like, that's cool. Like, it's Iron Man. He's like this, he's this superhero and he's having panic attacks. He freaks out, thinks he's having a heart attack. So yeah, you're, you're definitely right, uh, Andres, that they've, they've done this before. Um, which I appreciate. It's, it's just, it's kind of the, the depth that they're continuing to go in is still surprising. Yeah. And I, I would agree. I mean, I've, I've had anxiety attacks in, in my life and mm. uh, they, they played it very, very real. It was very relatable. And, and I'm, I'm a fan of Iron Man three for that reason. Mm. Uh, I, I like it quite a bit more than Iron Man two anyway. Oh yeah. Same here. I but, actually uh, don't uh, like, uh, or I don't hate Iron Man three either. I like it too. See, we all like it. I, it, I, is. it seems like everyone else on the internet is, it just bashes on it but whatever it's just it's uh it's because they keep thinking they ruined the the mandarin but if you mm. watch it carefully people have pointed out they're like no the guy um i can't remember his name the guy yeah. who was pulling the strings oh he yeah, yeah no it was, he sorry go uh, he was actually the mandarin it's, oh okay he's just a different take on it people point out they're like no he's got the dragon tattoo like Oh, you're talking about what's his name, Guy Pierce? Maybe I, it's been a while since I've seen it, but yeah, me too. They're yeah. like that's the actual Mandarin in the movie. They didn't ruin yeah. his character by making the joke. It is so. Guy Guy Pierce, right? Memento. Am I saying his name wrong? No, uh, no, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I'll just say I. So not Ben Kingsley, but Guy Pierce's character. I mean, yes. that'd be in, that'd be interesting. I, I, he, 
it's supposed to, I guess, play into the new Shang-Chi movie that's coming out. Mm. Um, so maybe we'll see the proper Mandarin at some time. Okay. But yeah, sorry, back to back to WandaVision, my bad. Right. Um, yeah, so just moving forward, then I think uh, the next flashback, of course, is when Wanda goes to S.W.O.R.D., sees Vision's body, which they're dismantling. She wants to take him and bury him, uh, and Hayward won't allow it because he's $3 billion worth of vibranium. Uh, you were saying her performance in this episode, you were saying there was one moment. Was that moment in this scene? It was, yes. Okay. When um, after she, after he was, she was goaded by um, Hayward and she flies down to meet Vision or to touch him. And, I, and I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but she puts her hand on his cheek, tries to, tries to kind of do something with the magic and just through tears, she says, I can't feel you. And it's not, like I said, it's not overdone. It's not like big swooping camera shot up, the, the music swelling. No, it's just like, she kind of whispers, like, I can't feel you. And it's like, damn, I felt that. I, I re She really sold that to me. Well, that's, and that's one thing I love about her performance in this episode. I mean, she's got a couple of like really big emotional moments, uh, mm -hmm. one in the next scene, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. But so many moments in this episode was just really very subtle. Just little, the way she yeah. moves her head a little bit or the way she darts her eyes. And and yeah, that that scene could have been played so much bigger. And I'm so glad that they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, also, I, I wouldn't have made this connection, but a friend of mine pointed out that it was actually a callback to Infinity War. Uh, I think it's when they're trying to get the stone out of his head before Thanos shows up and Elizabeth or... Uh, Wanda just says to Vision, "All I can feel is you," and mm. so this was like a callback to that. Wow! Yeah, I didn't I even I didn't catch that. I think if I had made that connection, it would have been even more brutal. But <laughs> yeah. Um, so then, just quickly moving on, the final sort of flashback is we also find out that she did not take Vision's body. Like Hayward, as you said, must have doctored the footage or mm. something. Mm -hmm. But she goes, she leaves. She drives to Westview. We see what Westview looks like in reality. We see their residence. It's it's it doesn't look like a great place. It's a little, a, little crummy. Why don't, why don't a little you, rundown. You guys, get out of there. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Um, but she had this envelope in, in the front seat of her car, and we're sort of wondering what that is. And then she approaches this foundation where a house will be built. She opens up the, the envelope. It's a deed to the property. And there's a little note written that says to grow old in. Uh, v signed by vision with a little heart around it. And uh, that absolutely killed me. Mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, Wanda just, uh, this was her big emotional moment. She just, just crumples to her knees screaming and we see it happen. She creates the hex. She creates the house. She wills vision back into life without his body. How did that work for you? Uh, it, it worked well. I was a bit of a jerk leading up to it, though, because honestly, in her drive into Westview, it, worked, it just looked very run down. Everyone was very sad and dilapidated. Everything, every one droopy faces. So when she opened the thing and it was like to to grow old and all I could think about is Wanda saying like, really, Westview? Like you want to <laughs> grow old here? What a dick. I'm glad you're gone. No, but it, it's you know, it's heavy. It was like I said, it was the, more of a bombastic moment. Mm -hmm. Um and it's reminded me of the moment in Age of Ultron where uh, Pietro died and she was all the way across in the battlefield, but she felt it. And she also just kind of crumbled to the ground, big old energy fart, whatever, just, you know, blowing everybody back. Um, but this one was, it was, it's, instead of destruction, it was creation. And that was really right. interesting where she, she built the new house and we showed um, something that I, I didn't think was going to happen because of the way the last episode ended off with the, with the uh, music, uh, Agatha, it was Agatha all along. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that meant that Agatha literally did everything, but I guess not. She was just kind of like pulling the strings in a world that, uh, that Wanda created. So it was confirmation for me that it's like, Oh, Wanda, Wanda did all of this. So she, yeah. Like, like I said, did, did that surprise you or like after, cause after last episode, did you think that it was literally Agatha doing everything or no? <laughs> You know what? I, I, I probably would have, except for that one shot during that montage where we see uh, when she's at the barrier with Vision and it, it, we sort of see the other camera angle and we see that she's playing him. That kind of just suggested to me that this show is kind of playing us a little bit. So even mm -hmm. when it reveals something, we can't 
necessarily take it as truth. So uh, that's, uh, that's a good point. This, that's this particular, this particular episode, like, or from here on out, I'm not going to just buy any, everything until at least the season finale is over. For sure. That's a good point. Um, so then finally, basically, um, she creates vision. They have their home vision says, you know, Wanda welcome home, which was rough for me too. Mm-hmm. But then we get the big, the big climax of the episode where Agatha is basically choking out Tommy and Billy. That was a weird image, right? It was, like, it, it was a little weird. I mean, I was into it. I was into the emotions. Then she comes out and Catherine Hahn, she's rocking some eyeshadow. Now she's in a new outfit and she's just choking kids. I'm like, all right, Disney, this is, <laughs> this is getting a little weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but of course, um, then we find out, she basically says, this is chaos magic. You are the Scarlet Witch. And that's, that's the big sort of ending of the episode. Yeah. I, how did that, how did that work for you? Cause that kind of, like I said, I've read comics before. I've read Marvel comics um, and stuff, but I'm not that well versed in them. There are people who know infinitely more about comics than I do. Um, so I knew that her moniker was um, Scarlet Witch. And I watched it with my wife and even her at the end where it was like, you are the Scarlet Witch. Uh, and then like cut to, cut to credits. My wife was just like, wasn't she always the Scarlet Witch? Like it didn't, I don't think it had that reveal the same way that it, that it was intended it reminded me not as bad as this but it reminded me of star trek into darkness where benedict cucumber patch is he's in the he's in the prison cell and he says to to kirk and spock i am Khan," but it doesn't mean anything because it doesn't mean anything to the characters and the audience is just kind of like okay that's kind of how it felt to me it's like you're the scarlet witch yeah it was a little film yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've never seen it. I've never seen really? it. Really? Oh, okay. Keep it that way. Right. <laughs> Interesting. I, I liked the first Abrams Star Trek, but I'm, I, I've had a lot of people tell me the next two were not not good. So, mm. um, but yeah, yeah. When when she said you are the Scarlet Witch, uh, like you, like you and your wife, I was just kind of like, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, no, yeah, no, duh. Thanks. All right. <laughs> it was a it was a weird uh, moment to end on, but. As typical with most Marvel stuff, wasn't the the last bit. There was right. also a mid mid cre- mid credit scene this time. Didn't know that the first time. I should have should have checked. I don't know why. But my second watch, um, yeah, th- there was a reveal that Hayward. This is this is what's interesting to me is that Hayward brought the actual body of of Vision, and then they recreated it and used I don't know some some leftover Wanda energy, some some. <laughs> I don't know what to call it, but the Hughes leftover Wanda energy to rev up the white vision, which is also from the comics. It looks kind of sinister. So there's going to be like a vision on vision action in the some next hot moment. vision on vision. Yeah, action. Some hot, hot action. Uh, it's going to be a oh, Royal geez. Rumble, man. I know it, there's going to be uh, vision, vision, Wanda, the two kids, Mike and Ike, I forget what they're called. Um, <laughs> uh, Agatha. Um, it's going to be a good old fashioned superhero rumble, I can imagine. But what the, the reason why it was interesting was that what, what, how do I put this into words? What did Wanda do? Like she, she seemed to somehow create vision and he's not just an illusion because he, he's shown throughout the series to be sentient and to have his own free will and, and to be curious and want to leave. And the kids also seem to be real because if they were just illusions that she created, then, you know, Catherine Hahn choking the kids out uh, wouldn't matter. She wouldn't, you know, wouldn't worry about their safety. So how the hell did she create them? Yeah, I'm, I'm still unclear. I think I, I'm hoping those are questions that are going to get answered in, in yeah. the finale. I'm worried about there being one more. Epi- I mean, like, I'm happy that it's, it's kind of wrapping up to a conclusion. But there's a lot of loose threads, I think, right. that, that I'm, I'm afraid in, in typical Marvel fashion. It's like, are you just going to like answer some, but then keep a lot of them dangling for future stuff? It'd be nice to, to have a little bit of closure on this. Well, and, uh, you know, like we discussed last week, you know, this episode did end up being a little bit longer than most. I think it was about 10 minutes longer than most. So mm-hmm. hopefully next week will be the same or even a little bit more because so. it, it does feel like there's a lot that they have to tie together. For sure. Yeah. No, I, I'm really hoping for, for, you know, closer to, to an hour um just make it big go big mm-hmm. it's it's the last episode give us give us some answers that's all i'm hoping for i don't i know that there will be some things left open but i'm hoping that it's there's more answers than there are cliffhangers right all right so that's that's wandavision i think we should probably move on mm-hmm. um so the next topic of the day is of course 
J.J. Abrams will be producing some kind of Superman reboot for Warner Brothers in D.C. Uh, this news came from Deadline. We do not know if this is going to be a soft reboot that will still have Henry Cavill in the role. I kind of hope so. I really like Henry Cavill in that role. I think he plays it really well. Um, or it might be a hard reboot, uh, completely starting over. Now, I do want to bring up that it is being written by a man named Tanahisi Coates, who I've never heard of. Um, oh. No, I don't know. say? Uh, no, he's got. Uh, he's from what I can tell, he's mostly an author and a journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, the only film credit that he has is an upcoming Ryan Coogler drama called Wrong Answer. Okay, um, I'm interested in anything Ryan Coogler does, so that sure. sounds cool. And it, I believe it's with uh, Michael B. Jordan as well. Nice. Nice. So um, that's that's pretty much all we know right now. Uh, I think, Andres, you were saying you had some thoughts, though. Well, I, I just want to know, uh, like, is this going to be part of the DCEU? How much information do we know at this point? Very, very little. It's nothing, really. Because it's it's one thing to replace, like, Jimmy Olsen, or even if we want to go, I hate going Marvel when we're talking DC, but replacing the Incredible Hulk, kind of a background character, but you take a pillar that launched the DCEU and you replace him. That's weird. I mean, they're already kind of doing that with they have the Robert Pattinson Batman. And they, so I think that, uh, I, th I don't know if it's Walter Hamada, but someone, someone at Warner Brothers has said that like, look, we're just going to have, you know, different different things going on. And they might explain it in the Flashpoint movie where there's multiverses and everything. Now, the new thing now is multiverses. Everyone's doing mm -hmm. a multiverse. Yeah. Um, so they might so they might explain it that way. But there is already <clears throat> precedence, I suppose, with um, they're going to have the Robert Pattinson movies go forward. And that's not technically connected to the DCEU. At the same time, they're going to have that Flash movie with Ezra Miller, uh, Michael Keaton's returning and Ben Affleck's returning. So it's like, so yeah, I mean, I suppose if even if Cavill isn't in this new one, I don't think that necessarily negates him from ever returning. Right. Hopefully. Uh, well, and the other thing too is that we don't know, like with the Snyder cut coming very, very soon now, a couple of weeks, that that might put a cap on on that version of Superman. We no idea. True. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one thing that some some people were bringing up, especially because of the the writer's connection with with like Ryan Coogler and in some of his other work not related to film, is that people were thinking, is this going to be Clark Kent or is it going to be the character uh, Calvin Ellis, uh, which is a uh, essentially Superman, but he's a black uh, fictional character in the comics. Okay. So that'd be interesting, and this is similar to kind of how Miles Morales is, you know, has Spider Man's powers, but it's different character, different origin, this, this, and that. Calvin Ellis is similar. I'm not too familiar with with the character, but it's like, yeah, I mean that that'd be cool. It's a different take on it. It'd be, you know, we've seen Clark Kent a, a million times. We we have, and um, in through animation and comics and in live action, um, both movies and TV shows. So if 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 they're doing something similar, like where they're getting a different kind of superhero, I'm all for it. Um, that would be great. That'd be interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd be into that. Mm -hmm. Andres, do you have any thoughts you want to share before we move on? Or JJ Abrams, you said? <laughs> he's, he's producing. It doesn't look like he's directing. <clears throat> oh. Well, the good thing about JJ Abrams is no matter how shaky the subsequent films of any property he reboots are, the films he has a direct hand in tend to be really good. You know, like the Star Trek movie was pretty awesome. The mm -hmm. uh Force Awakens was pretty awesome. I it's, love Force Awakens. Unabashedly, I love, yeah. I love, yeah. I love yeah. the Force Awakens as well. I think it's, I think it's great. Um, but once again, it's like, it's another movie studio where it's like, do you know what you're doing? We've got a history of studios that don't know what they're doing. It causes problems, but I'll give it a go. Yeah, sure. Sure. All right, well, let's... I, uh, oh, oh, just, before we go, I was just going to say, I, I trust J.J. Abrams. I'm not a fan of Rise of Skywalker, but... I, from what I've heard from different, you know, sources inside, not that I have any connections or anything, but just like what's been reported. Um, a lot of creative control was taken away from Abrams with the last Star Wars film. Um, so I don't really fully blame him for it. 
but most of his track record's pretty good. You know, um, the Mission Impossible 3, Super 8, uh, one of the Star Trek films, and Force Awakens. So even if he does end up directing it, I'd, I'd be down for it. And uh, uh, well, uh, two quick things, but I, I found this out recently. Do you guys, did you guys know a movie? It's from like, I think the early 90s called Regarding Henry with uh, yeah. Harrison Ford. No. J.J. Abrams wrote that. Yeah, oh. first script. It's yep. just a bushy, bushy eye, a bush. What is it? Bushy tail? Bushy yeah. beard? Something. What is the term? Something bushy. He was a bushy Something kid. Bushy. There was something bushy about him. Let me tell you. Um, but yeah, I, I remember <laughs> finding that out. Um, it makes me just jealous. I, for spoilers for for new for people who are watching who are more familiar with Court. I I I'm a wannabe filmmaker. I, I, I'm not just a film fan. Wannabe filmmaker. So whenever there's stories about a bushy J.J. Abrams just writing a like a script that stars Harrison Ford when he was like, I don't know, like 12 or something. He was a young, he was a young yeah. kid when he wrote that. I'm just like, oh man, what am I or doing? Or like uh, like, Quentin Tarantino in a movie store. And then one day they're like, hey, how about Reservoir Dogs? Yeah, but yeah. Right. <laughs> he just did it. So anyway, that's my I, event. And I do want to say just quickly about the Star Wars thing. I think, I think it'll be fascinating in probably two or three years somebody's going to make a documentary and it won't be Disney because all the Disney documentaries about Star Wars are like, how great is Star Wars? Someone's going to make a documentary about this trilogy, the sequel trilogy mm -hmm. and everything that happened. And I'm there for it. I'm Can't there. Watch Absolutely. It. There's going to, there's going to be some weird behind the scenes stuff that we oh, yeah. just never heard before. Absolutely. Uh, just wait till they get to the last Jedi Ooh. chapter of that film. It's going to be, entertaining <laughs> i don't hate that movie as much as everybody i don't love it either but uh there, there are good things about it for me and there's a lot of schlock and a lot there's... of boring i will say this much when i saw all of social media pumping articles out about porgs incessantly i knew it was going to be a problem because right because when you're <laughs> focusing on how cute porgs are you're like okay but what's uh what's going on oh i see that that's after you've seen it. You're like, mm. I have a lot of thoughts on the Last Jedi, um, but it's too much to go into now. Maybe another, I mean, maybe another time we can do a deep dive into Star Wars. Maybe that'll be a discussion. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. There's a lot to talk about. All right. So uh, next, uh, we'll just very quickly uh, again. Zack Snyder is making this zombie heist movie, which already has me very curious. Um, called Army of the Dead. He's doing it for Netflix. I believe it comes out in May. And it's interesting because, of course, Zack Snyder's first uh, feature film was his Dawn of the Dead remake, mm -hmm. which I should say was filmed at my mall. Uh, hey! hey. I, I, uh, I was working at the mall at the time, so I was like watching them film. And What? Uh, yeah, it was, it was really, really cool. Yeah, I didn't but, know um, that either. They had, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but in the, in the film... They had a couple of trucks that they'd like put, you know, grills on and all this kind of stuff so they could drive through zombies. Yes. And those were just like sitting in the underground parking so we could go and look at them and take pictures. And at one point uh, they threw a bunch of stuff out when they were done. And so they had like a sign for Crossroads Mall, which is in the movie. And it looks mm -hmm. like granite in the movie. It was plastic, but I took it because it was in the garbage. Why I don't not? have it. I don't. Hell have yeah. It. Oh man, I would have kept dumpster that. diving for the win. <laughs> it was it was kind of it was kind of broken, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So you That's guys, cool. you guys have watched the uh, the teaser trailer for Army of the Dead. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on it, Andres? Do you want to go first? No, I want Chris to go first. Okay, I sure. First, many times. Before. That's fair. Um, I I thought the you know right off the bat, uh, even before the teaser, I thought the premise was interesting. It's essentially a it's a heist film during a zombie apocalypse. I haven't quite seen that. I, I from my recollection, I, I can't think of something ha that is similar premise to that. Um, the teaser itself, it's it's okay. I but in the the way I would cl uh, classify how the teaser made me feel in the pre-COVID times, the before times, is I would say it, it seems like a rental. Like if right. I saw this as like a te is a teaser for a movie that was going to come out in theaters, I'd be like, I'd rent it. Um, like I said, the heist aspect of it is really what's kind of pulling me in. Um, zombies are fun. I love zombies. I'm not a big fan of when it's just a bunch of CGI hordes of zombies, like um, like World War Z or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't do anything for me because it just kind of loses any sort of weight, any sort of threat because they just it just looks CGI to me. So that I'm not I'm not too keen on. Um, 
but like I said, just the heist alone, I mean, the heist aspect alone, and it's in Vegas, that sounds interesting. So I definitely, and since it's on Netflix, it's not going to cost me anything. I'll watch it. It's, it seems cool. Andres, what do you think? I've got three thoughts on the matter. Um, my first one, I'm glad to see Snyder's doing something that isn't posting behind the scenes photos of Justice League on Twitter right. like he's <laughs> been doing. Like, mm-hmm. thank you. Do something else. Thank you. Uh, to me, in all honesty, I watched the trailer. I just thought it just looks like another bloated, generic, modern zombie film. Um, and I was talking to my girlfriend about this and she pointed out this out. She's like, okay, it's a heist film, but like if a zombie outbreak occurs, the heist is off the table. You don't care about a heist anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's like at this point without knowing what the plot is, because the teaser is nothing. I'm mm-hmm. just like, uh, uh, rental, sure. Well, and this, this is one thought I had during, during this teaser is like, you know, if it's if it's zombie apocalypse, how useful is money? Yeah. Like yes. particularly in this trailer, like it looks like most of the world is zombie. You got that one that one aerial shot looking down. It was a very CGI shot for sure, but it looks like hundreds of thousands of surging zombies. How useful is money? Yeah. Right. So in the movie's defense, because it's just a teaser and I didn't look up that much. Is this is it a, entirely the world uh, apocalypse? Is it just like for some reason Vegas went to hell for <laughs> for one weekend? Um, we don't know. So it's it maybe maybe there's an explanation where it's like okay, this is not a worldwide epidemic or pandemic. It would be. Um, it's it's just more localized, so we could still get money and get the hell out of Dodge, and it could be useful because that what would happens. make that would make sense. Was that? What happens in Vegas will hopefully stay in Vegas. Hopefully, right. all the hopefully stay with the with the CGI zombies. Just just having a mosh pit. Um, uh, oh, go on. Oh. Uh, I was just uh, one other thought. I, I I found this very striking, but the titles look exactly like Suicide Squad. Yeah, I thought that. I thought that too. It was definitely like just not just the font, but like kind of the the teaser itself just reminded me of kind of like the the latter. A suicide squad trailers where it's just kind of like it's like machine gun metal mixed with these neon colorful lights right. and it's kind of like this tongue-in-cheek kind of rock and roll vibe punk rock vibe which is it's fine you know suicide squad didn't invent that i suppose so that's fine with it i'm i'm more i'm for it having a bit more style a bit more fun than some of his Zack snyder's previous work yes. um so i'm like yeah sure do it one thing I want to add in this, I so no one jump on me in the comments. I, I promise I'm not saying that this is an actual issue with the movie, but just a thought I had for a movie that's about a zombie heist. What's with the title? Like Army of the Dead. Like if you're called zombie heist or something like right. <laughs> I don't. It's just I know it's like in the the long lineage of of the dead titles. There's a million of those. Yeah, but. but- but if you're yeah. not George Romero, don't use of the dead. Well, he's not the only one. But that's 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 fine. I get that. But it's more about the army of the dead. It just makes it sound like a zombie war movie, which is fine. But wouldn't you want something to kind of like sell what the premise is? I would love it more if it had a stupid title like Zombie Heist. Just or, go heist, with it. Heist of the Dead? Is that stupid? Heist of the Dead? No, I like that. Um, in, in fairness to Snyder, like as far as using of the dead, like I said, he, he did remake Dawn of the Dead. So it's kind yeah. of it's in his. Uh, That's his, a fair point. It's yeah. in the oeuvre of Zack Snyder. But he's 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 earned the uh, the rights to use it. <laughs> right. uh, I just want to make a quick I'm, I'm not a huge zombie guy. Like I like zombie movies. I love mm. 28 Days Later. I know some people Ooh. say it's not a zombie movie, but it's a zombie movie. But it's a they're, zombie movie. They're not undead, but but. Have you guys seen uh, Maggie? Oh, Schwarzenegger. Jill and Hall? No, no. no. <laughs> Have you ever seen it? Have you seen Maggie? Um, no, I've, I've been meaning to. I heard, I heard uh, Arnold was good in it. So I loved Maggie. I thought it was, it was it's Arnold Schwarzenegger and... Um, oh, what's Maggie Gyllenhaal? Hall? And Maggie no. Gyllenhaal. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maggie Brez- Smith. Breslin. Um, Abigail Breslin. Abigail Breslin. Uh-huh. The, the only thing I didn't buy about this movie is that Arnold Schwarzenegger plays like a farmer in like Ohio, like middle a middle American farmer named Wade, and I was just like, no, sorry, no, <laughs> it is, it is, it's a uh, thick Austrian accent. 
Yeah. He is Wade. I love like. I love Arnold. He can't play every man. He right. can, he has more range as he's gotten older, but he's I can never buy him as he's it's me, everyday man. Come on. It's pretty good. Um, it's not. Don't worry. Don't don't. <laughs> you don't have to lie. To me. Duster. Come on, Maggie. I'll... Better than I could do. Uh, right. But what, what I love about this, and he is like he's legit amazing in the film. Okay. There is a scene. There is a scene where Arnold Schwarzenegger cries, and I bought it all the way. But what's so cool about this movie is it's not really a zombie movie. There are zombies in it, mm-hmm. but the basic premise is his daughter gets bitten, and in this universe it takes about two weeks to turn and sort of normally when people get bitten, the government come and take them and quarantine them and I guess kill them or whatever. Mm -hmm. But Arnie says no. And he, he stays with her and it's essentially, it's a movie about um, uh, basically a fatal illness. It's him coming to terms with the fact that in two weeks, he's going to lose his daughter to this, this, this fatal uh, plague or whatever you want to call it. And on that level, never heard of this before you should definitely check it out I'm, i'll recommend it to everybody out there don't go in expecting dawn of the dead it's a very different kind of movie. it's a very solemn quiet film but it's really good and abigail breslin's great in it too yeah no i've <laughs> it's i'm not surprised you haven't heard of it on just like it kind of flew under the radar mm-hmm. i remember like i remember it also like briefly popped up on my radar i'm like oh that's cool um i'll check it out when it comes out and then i just never heard of it again right <laughs> all right so now, I guess let's uh, talk about this uh, Zack Snyder Vanity Fair article by Anthony Bresnikan. I don't want to spend too much time on it because we're, we've already gone about an hour, but um, have you both read it all the way through? Or? Yeah, I was never able to get it because of the subscription I, yeah, I, uh, yeah, but, I, but I, I went over it with Andre, so I feel like we're both, we're both up to speed with it. Okay. Uh, were there any specific things that stood out to you that you want to talk about? or um, A few things. One is I... I liked how this didn't feel um, like brown nosing. It's the the article I think was very objective. It didn't feel like Zack Snyder is the most visionary director. You know what I mean? But at right. the same time, it was just kind of like it. It was kind of breaking down um, the past few years for this in this guy's life, um, who seems like a genuinely nice person in real life. Like regardless of what you think about his his filmmaking or his filmmaking styles. Um, he seems like a genuinely nice guy in a, in a world full of cancellations and, and people getting me too it. He seems like everyone gets along with him and he hasn't crossed the line with anybody. Right. Um, and it's just kind of a heartbreaking story. Um, you know, it's been a few years, but it's just what happened with his daughter is, is just absolutely devastating and how much it's affected him and influenced his, his life. Um, going forward it'd be interesting to see how it changes him as a filmmaker well and I, I will say that before i read the article you know they had put out a, a new trailer for snyder cut recently and it used a cover of the uh, leonard cohen song hallelujah which is a great song the best versions by jeff buckley but whatever um but i i kind of thought to myself like really like you you use the song you he used the leonard cohen song version of the song in Watchmen. yeah and now you're going to use it in the trailer for this. And then maybe it's going to be in the movie. And it seemed like overkill to me. And then in this article, it says that um, it was his daughter Autumn's favorite song. Uh, this cover is by someone by, the, I believe by the name of Alison Crow. It will be in the movie. They also said the film is going to end with the words for Autumn and read that. And I was like, down, I'm totally down. That's cool. I get it. I, I got to say, though, that's kind of weird when you think about where it was used in Watchmen. Like, yeah. Oh, his true. daughter's favorite song. It's true. Looks, and also that was like 11 years ago. So she was a kid. So it's like, oh, yeah. this is your favorite song? Here's this really awkward <laughs> sex scene. Here's what's his name? Um, who's it? Patrick Wilson. Here's Patrick yeah. Wilson's butt. <laughs> Way to go. No, but that is sweet. I because I, I remember when the teaser came out and it had Hallelujah. I was like, I get it. He used it in Watchmen. This feels a bit kind of on the nose. Um, but as a tribute to his daughter, that's pretty sweet. You know, right. you, can't, you can't deny that. Uh, so, uh, Andres, was there anything from what you guys talked about that stuck out to you? I don't know enough of the article to speak about it yet. Okay. okay. Um, well, do you, do you remember when I brought up the thing about um, how Christopher Nolan watched it with uh, Deborah Snyder? And afterwards, Christopher Christopher Nolan was like explicitly saying, 
uh, did I say Watchmen? Sorry, he watched uh, he watched uh, the Joss Whedon version of Justice League with Deborah Snyder without Zack Snyder. Uh, and then afterwards, he was like, we can never show Zack Snyder. Like, Zack can never watch it. It'll just break his heart. Right. Um, I, I thought that was pretty brutal. Like, I didn't, yeah. it, maybe it wasn't intended to be, but like, just hearing that from other filmmakers saying that, like, that's, that's it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's and of I course, thought. before you jump in here, Andres, just just for context, uh, Christopher Nolan was, of course, a producer on Man of Steel. So presumably he and Zack Snyder have uh, a relationship. Yes. Yeah. Um, so my question is when hashtag release the Snyder cut started happening, was it the fans that was, that were doing that? Or was that Snyder that was doing that? I believe the fans started it. I think Snyder sort of jumped onto it fairly early okay. on. See, and- my, my, my biggest issue with that is the fact that and I know the article does discuss, it does touch on this bizarre fandom that the DCEU has cultivated, this bizarre, mm-hmm. vitriolic, unpleasant fandom. My big thing, my big issue, even with, okay, I'm happy people are starting to sympathize with Snyder a little more. When you realize, because he knows who this fan base is and what they're like, to stoke the flames of these fans by posting these behind the scenes photos years after the fact, even if he's mourning, it's, that's really, that, that's not, that makes me really uncomfortable. And for him to start doing the release, the Snyder cut thing himself, it's just like, I understand it's a tragedy that he lost his daughter. It's sad. It's whatever happened, it, you know, with the film. Okay. Yes. It sucks that he didn't get his cut, but if you're looking at this in a bigger picture we're talking about a company's cinematic universe that they were working on even if he created it it's still their cinematic universe and for him to push forward and be like yes let me do my cut even though the company has decided they don't agree with what he was doing anymore they've they've moved on they've gone a different direction now for him to go forth and make his own cut it seems really selfish and it seems really rude because it's like this is bigger than you, man. I understand. I'm sorry this happened to you, but you know, it's just, that's, it's, this is bigger than you. It's bigger than you, man. And that's why I've been against this the entire time because it's like, you have to look at the bigger picture. I'm sorry this happened, but you have to look at the bigger picture. Well, it's interesting because in the article, uh, it does say that I I believe it's uh, Toby Emmerich from Warner brothers. I think approached Zack Snyder because I think Warner Brothers or people at Warner Brothers did eventually feel really bad about how things went down. And they knew he had this cut, this like incomplete cut. And they actually talk at one point, they were like, why don't you just put it out on HBO Max the way it was? And he was like, no, no. Cause then, you know, I put out an inferior cut of the movie and then you guys get to make all the money from it and tell all the fans who wanted it. Like, see, it wasn't very good anyway, but I think Warren brothers did approach him to say, can we work something out where we can, if we do HBO max, would you want to finish this thing and blah, blah, blah. And I think they all kind of came together on that because Warner brothers knew the fans really wanted it. They wanted to put something really big on HBO max, which, you know, is still not still launching, but it's still kind of in its infancy. It's still trying to launch. It's, right. It's been a, it's been out for less than a year, hasn't it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still, it's still relatively new for yeah. sure. Um, no, I'm just, you, br- you bring up good points. I, um, I think that they didn't go into it like that much depth in this article, but they did kind of, to what court was saying, they did kind of mention that there were some people on, on from Warner brothers that were on Zach's side in the sense that, um, well, you know, it's, it's as, as awful as it sounds in, as this is coming from someone that's like a, an aspiring wannabe filmmaker himself, when it comes to these big, massive tent poles and these these massive franchises, it's you know it's the, there's the filmmakers, there's the directors of it, the writers, but at the end of the day, it's the studio that's putting up the money, hmm. um, and it happens far more often than we think. You know, reshoots happen uh, all the time for big movies, even successful yeah. ones, even if there's no animosity. And I think that there was just I think the the difference and the reason why this. Um, they, they're even kind of releasing the Snyder cut and Warner brothers has gave the green light was a couple things is that 
I think that at, at some point there was so much change that happened to um, Justice League after Joss Whedon came on. There was so much that was just altered and different, differed that there was like this practice, you know, it wasn't, it was unfinished, but it's like, there's pretty much a, there's an entire other movie that's, that's, you know, just sitting here. And it was, it was this guy's vision. And ordinarily we just kind of, you know, dump it into the garbage. But um, regardless of how kind of like angry and vitriolic the, the fan base has been. Um, and I will touch on that in a second as well, because the article mentions something interesting about it, but regardless of how vitriolic people have been, Warner Brothers it was eventually, or at least the people at Warner Media uh, behind uh, HBO Max were like, well, there's an, there's an appetite for this. So in any other situation, it'd be like, well, this is just scraps that end up on the cutting room floor. But hey, if, if this many people want to see it, why not? You know, like, just yeah, at least it. So, so I can see kind of both sides where it's like, yeah, as a, as like a director, to a certain extent, you only have a bit of creative control for these giant massive movies besides that it's it's kind of up to the studio for better or for worse and in case of justice league it seemed like it was for the worse potentially what what happened with joss's cut um but in addition i about the toxic kind of uh people within the fan base um there you know with with every kind of fan base there's there's good and there's bad and there's a lot of people within the fan base as well that have um used it the snyder cut fan base that have used it as a platform to um, raise awareness and funds and donations for suicide prevention. Uh, and a lot of the proceeds to- for the Snyder Cut are going to go to uh, uh, suicide prevention kind of uh, services, stuff like that. So there's a lot of good that's ha- that has been done. And I don't, I don't want to, you know, overstep that. I don't want to like ignore that. So it's one of those, like, you take the good, I, mean, I don't know if you take the good with the bad, but there's, there's two sides to it because I have seen, and I've been on the, I've been on the receiving end of, of um, just like very, very kind of toxic people that, that it's just like, are you, Oh, you want to see the Snyder cut? I'm like, eh. like if you're not as excited as they are, they go right for the jugular and they, they will like your mother did this with a dog. And right. it's, it's, oh, just yeah. Awful. yeah, man. Uh, but it's, you know, so I, I think a lot of fan bases have that though. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a little different with the DCEU. They're way more brutal. I mean, they will go <laughs> troll Marvel posts on social media and you're like, dude, calm down. Jesus. Star Wars fans can get pretty brutal too. Though. Yeah. I was, mm. yeah. Oh, I mean, they, well, dude, they, they've, they, uh, brutalized Kelly, Kelly Marie Tran online yeah. that, you know, with just okay. repugnant of racial slurs. Yeah. They, so there's that's there's, fair. There's talk. There's toxicity, and you're right. I mean, it's like it's hard to like accurately gauge what is the actual most toxic fan base. It just kind of depends on how much you're seeing versus how much you know goes unnoticed by you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. No. If if Justice League weren't such a tentpole film in the DCEU, I probably wouldn't be as like resistant to it because it's it's not like an offshoot like oh it's one of the iron man films you know i hate bringing marvel up in the dc conversation oh, oh. but i did but it's like get them in the comments boys oh my goodness but you know because it's justice league it's like the centerpiece <laughs> for this cinematic universe it's like but you're trying to move and yes i do understand completely as you guys are saying yeah there is money to be made now so yeah they're gonna do it but yeah it's 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 like really uncomfortable to be teetering like that when you're trying to push in a different direction. So that's fair. No, it's a, that's a fair perspective to have on it. Um, yeah, and I, I think it, it just kind of shows that there can be a whole spectrum, and we can all get along, guys. You know, there's people who are just like pulling their hair out. They're so excited for Justice League Snyder Cut, and then you know, there's people who are like, mm, "That's kind of weird to me, man. That's kind of icky that this whole the way this whole thing happened." And yeah. to an, to an extent, it's it's a nice it regardless of kind of how it came about it's good that he he's snyder's able to kind of finish this um that's a that's yeah. a rarity for filmmakers there are director's cuts that have happened but the just given the reins back to the to to this to his baby even though it is this big studio film still feels still seems very personal every film is very personal for a filmmaker oh, um yeah. So it's in, in a way it's it's still really cool. I'm like that's that's also part of the reason why I'm interested. I, oh, yeah. I uh, well before we it was announced that the actual Snyder cut was coming, I was I was honestly uh, like interested in just seeing a rough cut 
Like if he just released it as it was without finished special effects, I would have been interested in checking that out just out sure. of curiosity's sake. Yeah, just to see how different it was, right? For sure, yeah. Yeah. And it is it is interesting to note too, uh, one thing it said in this article is that um, he's not making any money for this. Uh, yeah. He sort of, he said, uh, keep your money, let me have creative control. Like now that if we're doing this, let's just do it. Let's go all the way. Mm -hmm. so he's, he's not getting a paycheck, um, which is kind of cool. Like just, just to show how much it is you know his baby it was worth it to him yeah i think that's cool yeah no that's that's very noble of him yeah yeah it, um, i i agree um the the whole article was 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 very well written and i thought that it painted zach like i said it didn't seem like it was like bowing down to like the holiest of holy filmmakers it, but it, it also kind of, wasn't it wasn't a Zack snyder hit piece either which oh, absolutely. A lot of. oh yeah absolutely it was it was very much treating him like a like just a real guy and mm -hmm. it was it was talking about him more as a person and and how the how things the most the recent events in his life affected him and his family um the dude's got a huge family apparently it was like yeah. going like he's got a ton of kids and a lot of them are adopted uh, his daughter autumn was adopted which i think is is wonderful um and and like i said i it's i think that the one thing that came across as well is regardless of what you think about his filmmaking as a personal level it seems like nobody can say a bad thing about this guy they right. they they really um he just seems like a genuine guy and and i it seems like he just seeing in interviews and stuff like that he seems like a total nerd in a, in the best yeah. way possible yeah like I, we're i'm we're i don't want to say i don't want to put it on you guys but i'm a big effing nerd mm -hmm. um so i, I feel I'm wearing like wearing a dalek t-shirt so. <laughs> that's true that's true we got okay i who am i talking to you're right um he seems like a cool guy like i'd grab a beer with him that kind of like oh yeah hit yeah. chat and stuff um one thing, uh, Court, I want to get your reaction on. Well, I forget who it was, but it said it was an unnamed studio exec after they viewed the Joss Whedon version of the Justice League. Oh, I have the quote. Please, Ooh. please, sir, allow us. Dispense yes. with the quotes. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a, a studio exec who uh, asked to re requested anonymity, but this person said to Anthony Bresnikan of Vanity Fair. When we got to see what Joss actually did, it was stupefying. The robber on the rooftop, so goofy and awful. The Russian family, so useless and pointless. Everybody knew it. It was so awkward because no one wanted to, to admit what a piece of shit it was. Wow, this is brutal. I yeah. love it. Um, yeah, man, it's 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 weird how they they really were. The studio was pushing in that direction. Like, oh, Joss Whedon, he did the Avengers, you know, made Marvel a gajillion dollars. This is going to be money in the bag, baby. And then it was just like, what? Yeah. Dostoevsky, like what? I was just going to say, like, oh, my God. That's probably the oh. biggest cringe moment in that movie. It's yeah. it's funny because it's a Russian word. H hilarious. What a what a goober. Um <laughs> such a goob and uh i know there's we could we'll talk more about the justice league i i didn't hate it as it took me forever to watch it i didn't watch it when it first came out because like it seemed like it pleased nobody but right. i watched it recently and it's just like okay okay I, I have a lot of thoughts on it i'm sure we'll get into it as we when we review the actual uh right. Snyder cut as well i'll tell you guys what you let me know when we're gonna talk about it i'll sit down and watch it there you go in there protest. <laughs> Appreciate it, sir. All right, so I think uh, we have probably just enough time to move on to Andres. If you want to pose your question, we'll have a little yes. round table. All right, gentlemen, the question for you both and myself, because I'm involved as well. What is this voice? I don't even know. Uh, what remake do you feel was better than the original and why? I guess I'll start. Yes, go for it. Okay, I'm gonna do this. So, I said reboot too, right? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, your, it's okay. your question. <laughs> okay, I just wanna make sure, because uh, I'm about to talk about a reboot. It's a reboot you both know. Oh. So, in 1998, uh, Gus Van Sant directed uh, Psycho, starring Vince Vaughn. I'm kidding. I'm actually okay, going to talk about you, you were, Someone was going to make that joke. Oh, my God. I'm sorry for was, screaming. In I, was about, I was about to walk out. I knew. I was like, someone here is going to talk about 98 Psycho. Anyway, continue. <laughs> it's so bad. I was, uh, I'm actually going to talk about 
2005's Batman Begins. Mm -hmm. The reason I feel that one is because I, uh, growing up, I watched the Burton and Kill My Hello. The Burton uh, Schumacher films, and I never felt like it was a real city. It just sure. felt like set pieces. Sure. And Batman Begins was the first time not only the, the city felt real, the, the Dark Knight trilogy, Gotham feels like a real city. Right. They did film it in real cities, that helps. But uh, it also was the first time I ever saw what I felt personally was the successful execution of an interesting, that was a weird way to say that, an interesting duality between Bruce Wayne and Batman. It, all, the, all the other films, I never was interested in Bruce Wayne. I was like, yeah, let's bring Batman on. And here, you know, Christian Bale's performance, uh, I'm pretty sure we're all fans of it. it admits, uh, in spite of the bat rasp, the death metal voice, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I feel like Batman Begins brought so much levity and it took the Batman films to such a level that they'd never been before. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for me personally... Growing up, you know, I was into Batman, the animated series. I liked it, but I kind of went away from Batman for a while. And then the Nolan films happened. And I was like, oh, Batman, you say? Uh, so that is mine. Who wants to go next? Do you have any runner-ups, though? Because I remember we were talking about a, about a few runner-ups. No. no. No? No. Just Batman? Okay. All Just right. Batman. I mean, it's a, it's a great choice. It's a great In choice. Insert that clip of Michael Keaton from 89 saying, you want to get nuts, Jack? Let's get nuts. Now you want to get nuts? Come on. Let's get nuts. <laughs> and I, I, I love Batman 89. I love Michael it, Keaton. I love these mm -hmm. coming back. That's that's so cool. But it's yeah. true. I, I remember the first time I saw uh, Batman Begins um, with a couple of cackling buffoons sitting next to me, Murphy and Brendan ruining the movie <laughs> for me. But uh, no, I, I absolutely love that film. I think you're right uh, about Chicago. Like it really feels like a real place. Mm -hmm. And as far as like the duality, I, I was actually thinking about this last night, but I feel like Christian Bale kind of plays three characters. He does. There's the Batman character. There's the Bruce Wayne public persona. And then there's mm -hmm. the Bruce Wayne private persona. Yes. Public Bruce Wayne is a jerk. Uh, he's a womanizer. Private Bruce Wayne is he's a, he's a lovely guy. He's fun, when he's having conversations with Lucius or Alfred or Rachel. Great guy. And then there's Batman. Mm. Would that be a tryout even? Is that a word? It's possible. Uh, it is now. Oh, yeah. There we go. We're coining it here. Yeah. Triality. Um, you heard I mean, it first. <laughs> obviously, for for this might be some news, but the way that we know all of the three of us know each other is way back in the day we met on the IMDb, the Dark Knight uh, forum. Yes. Essentially just a message board or a bunch of, bunch of young, I'm going to use it again, bushy, bushy boys, bushy, bushy hair, boys. bushy, a bunch of bushy boys. Um, <laughs> so that's actually how we met. We just, we just started talking because we're like, Batman Begins was such a big part of our lives. And then the Dark Knight looked even you know, more amazing and that Heath Ledger, oh my God. And we were just talking about how excited we, we were in flash forward to what uh what is it 12 13 years later am i it's doing math right like that. it's like that, yeah it's wild um so yeah I, batman, I, batman, yeah good i think i should just uh when you mentioned that we all met on a batman form i think i'm gonna have to insert the clip of uh lloyd christmas going like man you are one pathetic loser <laughs> No, it is like for for the it's it sounds weird. I've never done it with anybody else, like in the sense that I don't have any internet friends. It's literally just like this cool community from from the IMDb board that that just spawned. And I'm like I'm friends with with a lot of people still on like Facebook and everything. Yeah. That, you know, it's no longer just hiding behind avatars and just uh, just fake usernames. It's like oh, this kid, this guy's married now, and this you know what I mean. It's it's right. it's cool. Um, so yeah, Batman Begins, great choice. Indeed. Thank you. Chris, you want to go next? Uh, yeah, sure. So I, I'm going to start with two quick runner-ups and then the, the proper one. The reason why I was going to say runner-ups is that I like these, I love these two movies that are runner-ups, but I felt, I'll, you'll see why I chose the, the, the top one. So um, one of them is the 1978 version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers with mm. Sutherland fantastic film i absolutely adore it it's it rewatched it very recently still holds up uh very anxiety inducing um 
I personally like it more than the 1956 original, uh, but the 1956 original is still great. It's still a classic. It's very, it's, you know, similar plot, but it's, it's very different in tone. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it took what could easily could have been, you know, a B movie plot and it treated it very seriously. So that's one movie where it's like, I prefer the remake, but if someone says they prefer the original, I'd be like, okay, that I, I totally understand. Um, another one, the, my, other, my number two spot runner up is The Departed. I love The Departed by Martin Scorsese, 2006, which is, of course, is a remake of the 2002 Hong Kong film Infernal Affairs. Infernal Affairs is really good. The Departed is fantastic. Um, it's about 30 minutes longer. It follows a very similar plot. It's about 30 minutes longer, but those 30 minutes are used to benefit and to heighten everything. It adds so much more depth to all of the characters. Um, it's... The, the original Hong Kong one is still a solid flick. I would recommend it. Uh, but just for me, I would still give it to The Departed because it's like you got Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, Jack Nicholson chewing the absolute scenery out of oh, everything. Yeah. Fantastic. And it's Scorsese, man. It's so good. Um, but the reason, but my number one and the reason why I chose it is because it's, it's one of the few remakes where I would actually say, don't even bother with the original. And that is 2001's Ocean's Eleven by Steven Soderbergh. Good one. A lot lot of people don't even realize that it's a remake, but there's a 1960s original film uh, with Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin. It was the Rat Pack. pack. Yeah, the the, the Rat Pack. The Rat Pack, the Rat Pack, exactly. Um, It's not confirmed, but it's my theory that at that time, because it was 1960 and it was in, in production late 50s, is that the three of them had a residency in Las Vegas where, you know, they would do perform shows. And I feel like some exec was just like, well, we have them here already. They're in Vegas. They're already together. Let's just make a movie. What should it be about? I don't know, a heist. It's nothing. It's, it's honestly nothing. Nothing. Um, to put it into context, I adore the, the 2001 Ocean's Eleven. Oh, me it's, too. Honest, it's honestly one of my favorite films of all time. Um, I'm not saying it's like the greatest thing ever, but as far as rewatchability, I could watch it over and over again. Um, it's such what's, an, what's that? Sorry, I was going to say, it's just the, the one word that I've always sort of associated with that movie was swagger. Like the oh, movie yeah. just has such swagger, you know? It's so cool. It, everything's so slick. Even about twenty years later, it's so stylish, and it's mm. it's not phony. It's it feels like this is cool. It was cool then. It's still cool now. And it's you know Clooney and Damon and Pitt, you know, at the height of their careers, and it's it's fantastic. The original, um, for those who haven't seen it, because like I said, a lot of people are surprised that it's even a remake. It's it has Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., and Frank Sinatra, but they don't do anything. The rest of the Ocean's Eleven cast. I couldn't even tell you who's who's on it. And, and I couldn't tell you what they do. The 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 remake, you know, that gives everybody their own personality, every member of the team, their own personality, their own skill set, where it's like Don Cheadle, you know, he's like the bomb expert. Then you get the technician guy and everybody has a part that, that you know, they're, they're a, a cog in the wheel. They're pieces in the, of the puzzle that fit together to pull off this awesome heist. The tiny acrobat. The tiny <laughs> acrobat, it's, which is awesome. He does his own stunts, which is killer. Um, but the, in the original, and um, this is not a hyperbole, the actual heist, which takes barely any planning, is they're trying to you know rob multiple casinos at the same time. They, they shut off the power to five casinos. They walk in to the safes, get the money, and they're gone that's it there's no plan wow. there's no there's no Sounds. style there's no like tension there's no there's nothing and the movie is just so dull and boring and for sounds, anybody it sounds, sounds very riveting <laughs> it's, not, yeah. it's, it's so dull and boring and it's it just um it's just not it's just not worth it it really just feels like they had these actors they wanted to put them in a movie together and everything afterwards just was an afterthought. Um, it sounds like a '60s movie for sure. Well, I love I love '60s films, and there's well, yeah. there's some great. All right, I personally love '60s films. Um, so it's so I don't want it to come across as like oh it's old so it's boring. That's no not no no no. I know I know what you're saying, and you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, no. And so and to put it in context, like I said, the 1950s invasion of the body snatchers, crack and pace. Go check that out. 1960s <clears throat> Ocean's Eleven snooze fest but the 2001 remake it's just so cool steven soderbergh's direction is is sublime it's just so stylish and it's so just spot on 
I even quite like the sequels. And I, don't, I know a lot of people don't. People hate on Ocean's 12. They're I hated fun. Ocean's 12. I hate fair. it. A lot I of kind of like the third the third one, but the 12 yeah, didn't work for me. They're back to Vegas, so it's pretty cool with the third one. But the original, you can't top it. You just watch it. It's it's a, an enjoyable time from start to finish. The the second the number one thing about the second one that just killed me. It just kind of ruined it for me. And it's not even a big thing, but like the whole thing about how Tess looks exactly like the actress uh, Julia Roberts. Mm-hmm. And then they make her pretend to be Julia Roberts to talk to Bruce Willis. That made me want to punch the movie in the face. <laughs> it's it was a little too, <clears throat> little too meta. Meta can be good and can be fun at times, but then yeah, it def it definitely kind of uh, overstayed its welcome. That it was like maybe it'd be funny if it was like a quick gag, but they that that's like integral, intricate. Like that's that's integral. Sorry to the plot. It's like that is how they pull off the heist. Is this multiple shenanigans of Tess as Julia Roberts with Bruce Willis as Bruce Willis. It's, it's weird. Yeah. Oh my. Uh, before I get to my thing, I should have brought this. Uh, I should have done this when we were talking Batman Begins. I totally forgot it was over there, but. Uh... Oh, let's see it. Oh uh, yeah. Hey, it's the hey. Tumblr. Thanks Beautiful. Rich. Rich gave this to me. You guys don't know who Rich is. Rich Thanks, is a Rich. great guy though. Classic right? Rich. Classic Rich. <clears throat> All right. So. I'm going to uh, give you guys one word about my movie and see if you guys can figure out what it is. All right. All right. Cheeseburger. Nothing. No. All right. So my, my pick for uh, my favorite remake of all time is David Cronenberg's 1986 film, the fly. Mm. Oh, damn it. I figured, I figured you would know that one, Andres. Because I, Jeff Goldblum looks like a patty. No, he pukes on the burger and he's like, oh. when he's mutating. Yeah, there, damn it. There is that, but there actually, no, I think he pukes on, uh, I think they're powdered donuts actually. But mm-hmm. there are a couple scenes where he and Gina Davis's character go on dates and she'll be like, let's go, cheeseburger. And then they go have a cheeseburger. And uh, one, thing I, one thing I'll add is again, shot in Toronto. Not very, hey. obvi- not very obviously Toronto in that movie, but mm-hmm. so I have seen the original 1958 film. I saw it as a little kid, so I don't remember it terribly well, but I remember it being, you know, kind of campy and goofy, kind of like a Twilight Zone episode, but a little bit sillier. As I recall, Vincent Price was in it. Yes. And, mm-hmm. and David- not as the bad guy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> David Cronenberg went in a very different direction with this. Yes. This is a full on, it's, it's a, it's 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 a tragic horror film there's a lot of body horror uh, which of course cronenberg does very very well uh one thing i love about it though compared to the original in the original the guy gets into the one pod there's a fly in there he goes through and he comes out the fly here they take the opposite approach jeff goldblum goes in there's a fly in there he goes through and then he slowly as you said andre slowly mutates into this absolutely grotesque thing and his you know relationship with gina davis falls apart the ending is absolutely tragic in every way it's gross in the best way jeff goldblum's amazing in it gina davis is really good in it too so that's my pick uh if you guys haven't seen the fly check it out but oh it's gonna turn your stomach turn this off and go watch Mm -hmm. great (laughs) great movie i i love the fly with with jeff goldblum i would even recommend the the original um it's Turn this what? off. Keep watching. Sorry, guys. Oh no, I feel yeah. Uh, yeah. Please, please stay with us. Um, no, I I think both are great. But what Cronenberg did, just to kind of the vision of it, in the sense of you, you, they're so night and day. Even though it's pretty much very, very similar, identical plots, but it's just so different. And the, so the vision that Cronenberg had to be like, let's take this idea and really just you know dial it up. Um, and and make it not just him turning into a fly, but just kind of his body just changing from the inside out and, and becoming this disgusting creature. And the practical effects are are oh, top notch. They're amazing. Yeah, it's incredible. It, that, that was uh, the there's a it's the trifecta of remakes from the '80s: the fly, the blob, the thing. All I, three I, of them. I and knew, it, yeah, I knew that I was going to say that I knew that at least one of them were, was going to be on here. It, those three in particular just are great. Yeah. Right. 
an interesting piece of trivia. I think this project is now dead, but years ago, um, there was going to be a remake of Cronenberg's version of The Fly uh, to be directed by somebody, throw out a guess. Ah. Uh, Rob Zombie? J.J. Abrams, I don't know. <laughs> David Cronenberg. What? He was going to remake his own movie. And I can't think of many uh, times that that's happened in Hollywood. I know, um, I know, I believe Hitchcock remade his own, uh, I think it was The Man Who Knew Too Much. Yeah. But I Hitch- can't. So uh, Hitch- Hitchcock's done that. Uh, Cecil B. DeMille did that with the Ten Commandments. There was a yes, 20th silent version. Then there was a 50s version with Charleston Heston. But it's rare. It's that is rare. And I would have I would check that out, dude. If, totally. If, if Cronenberg went back and like, what's he gonna do different? That'd be pretty cool, actually. Probably totally. like practical effects augmented with some gorilla CG, and it's like I hope. Just- no, no, good, good. Because when you augment CG or when you augment practical with CG, you get some pretty spectacular results. That's yeah. true. That's true. Um, did you guys know that they made an opera out of The Fly, Cronenberg's The Fly? Oh, I don't think so. Yeah, I never saw it because I'm not really into operas. But if you look it up, there is an opera. I don't know. I mean, pandemic, probably not in production anymore, but there yeah. was a run they did. That's interesting. I mean, that yeah. makes kind of sense. I mean, if you think of the subject matter in the story, it is operatic. It's it is very much a tragic love story. Just a so, tenor with his face falling up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was our impression of an opera singer. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I think uh, I think that's the show, fellas. Perfect. That's it, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we hope you guys uh, enjoyed watching. Jump down into the comments. Tell us what your favorite remake is. What do you think of J.J. Abrams rebooting Superman? All the, tops we t- uh, all the topics we talked about today. Love to hear your thoughts. Like I say, I read all the comments. I try and respond to everything when I can. So uh, definitely do that. Uh, as per always, hope you guys will uh, hit the like button, the subscribe button. Uh, all, you, you know, that stuff to do. Um, but yeah, before we go, uh, Chris, where can people follow you online? Uh, sorry, every time I just think of Jay Bauman from Red Letter Media, that's just like, smash that like button down yeah. below. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Art of Light and Shadow. That's my Instagram handle. Um, I just review movies and stuff. It's a fun time. Andres? You can find me if you do a YouTube search for Cheap Thrills Unspeakable Terror. I review uh, cheap, low budget sci fi and horror from the 30s all the way to the modern era. Mm. And you just put uh, you just put up a new one. Was it yesterday? Two days ago? Uh, on Friday, yes, it okay. was for a movie. I can't remember the name. Neon Maniacs. Right. I have a yeah. terrible memory. <laughs> and of course, uh, you guys can follow me on Instagram, on Twitter at Court Shake, and you're, you're already on my YouTube channel, so you know where that is. I will leave links to all of that stuff in the description box, so you can go check these fine fellas out. And uh, that's basically the show. We want to say thanks very much for watching. Uh, we hope you guys are all safe and healthy. Uh, you guys want to say bye? Yeah. Uh, see you in the same time next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Indeed. Toodles. <laughs> Later, guys. Have a good one. Media hysteria pass. Media hysteria pass. Media hysteria.